Hey, Amy. I'm Stacia. I think I'm the chair for this session. I want to make sure I'm in the right spot. I'm going to double check. Excellent. Yes, you're in the right spot. <laughs> oh, awesome. And can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. So Perfect. I'm going to be admitting people from the waiting room. And so the chime you're hearing, that's people coming into the session. And um, so I will let people in and then uh, we'll just make sure that we get our presenters. Um, I'll, I'll make them co-hosts when they get in here. Awesome. Thank you. Sure thing. I think I love the art on the back of your desk. The black frame with the pink. I can't tell what it is, but it's very lovely. Oh, and the hi, friends. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I was happy to see both of your names on the program. <laughs> good are you enjoying the conference? Yep. Yeah. Good. 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 You. Should I start or? Okay. Um. Okay. Can everybody see my shared screen? Thank you for the thumbs up there. That's always helpful. Um, so good morning. I'm Coley Lehman and I'm a doc student in curriculum and teaching at Columbia University Teachers College in New York City. Um, my presentation is reading as a political act, reading for ourselves, our communities and our liberation. And it's about a teacher book club study I did with a group of middle school teachers in the Pacific Northwest. So I, I wanna get started with, I'd like you to visit this poll and respond. Um, and there are two easy ways to participate. You can visit the URL and respond there, or you can text my name, Coley Lehman 100 to 22333. Um, and you can add to the poll right through text. Either way, please respond. Um, how would you describe your experiences with reading? Think about your own K-12 experience or your experience as an adult. You can think about reading for school and reading for pleasure. Um, I'm gonna move on a bit and introduce my talk a little bit, but I'll get back to your responses in a bit. Um, so please just add to the poll and you can respond more than once. So why teacher book clubs? Um, before I uh, was a doc student, I was an instructional coach at a middle school. Um, and I noticed many teachers had negative experiences when they were students in English language arts class that made them critical of their own ability to be quote unquote good readers. Um, and this presentation is about a pilot study which is leading to a dissertation study on teacher book clubs. Um, the pilot study began with our book club reading New Kid by Jerry Craft, and much of this talk centers on that part of the work. Uh, I wanted book clubs to be a place to disrupt those negative conceptions and help teachers build new positive associations with their reading lives. The goal was for teachers to examine their own reading lives, take a reading for justice position through book clubs, and translate that to anti-racist justice and equity reading in their own classrooms. So, um, if we can look at the results here. So, when people are responding, um, things like sometimes great, sometimes not, it was hard, I loved reading. Um, uh, my teachers always chose the books. I liked magazines, that's a common thing that I hear. Um, 
Didn't love reading in school. I fell in love with reading when I got to start picking my own texts and stories. Positive, positive, loved it. Um, I think that that is, some of these are really common because we all ended up uh, having a connection to literature, that we have some positive experiences. But even those of us who had, um, have positive relationships now often talk about something that was not as positive when we were younger. Um, and people have strong emotional responses to reading because it's not a neutral act. Reading pedagogy and books themselves sit within a cultural context. Um, and I'm gonna... Back to this part here. Um, and if we have time at the end, we'll get back to, um, oops. We will get back to some of those results later. But um, so my work sits within um, the combination of uh, sociocultural theory and critical theory. Um, and I really liked this work by Mohe and Lewis because sociocultural theory helps us explain the relationships between culture and learning. And by adding critical theory, they allow us to understand how power, identity, and agency are at work in literacy and learning. Um, and then I've been thinking a lot about the, this phrase epistemological humility, and that describes my approach to research. I do qualitative research, um, but I align myself with the work of Freire and his notion of creation and recreation of the world. Um, and in addition, I'm influenced by affect theory and how bodies interact in the space of learning. Um, and I'm just going to briefly review this. So there's a beginning to be a good body of research on book clubs. And this is a small sample. Um, book clubs help teachers learn about new books and create new relationships with reading. In addition, they can help disrupt patterns of deficit thinking and help teachers develop a culturally sustaining pedagogy. Um, also, book clubs with social justice lit literature can help teachers find new ways to see reading as a political act and center justice and equity in their classrooms. So Mensa's work speaks about the relevance of text. And so when we began our teacher book club, really thought about what texts were important. And this is New Kid by Jerry Craft. It was the first book we used for our book club. And it served multiple purposes. One, it's a graphic novel, which we got a little, meant we got a little bit more practice with a genre that is more familiar to our students than ourselves. Um, and two, the book is nuanced and funny, but it deals with race and racism head on. And this meant our book club discussion centered on race more than they might have with other books. So the main character, Jordan, lives in Washington Heights um, in New York City. And if you know Lin-Manuel's uh, Miranda's In the Heights is coming out, just came out this week. Um, and that is centered in Washington Heights. Um, so Jordan lives in Washington Heights, but attends a private school in a different area of New York City. And it's a whiter, wealthier area. So in addition to the book being a graphic novel, Jordan likes to draw comics too. So there is the these insets where Jordan draws uh, comics in the book. Um, and this is one of Jordan's drawings. And he is sharing his experience code switching as he travels from home to school. So this metacognitive feature of the book allows readers to explore issues of race and class very directly. Um, it's not hidden in symbols or illusions, um, which made it a great first novel for our book club. We dissected this page and talked about what it meant and what it meant for us and what we knew about code switching and what it meant for our students. Um, and teachers were able to think about that and make their learning explicit with their students. So in my research study, I wanted to know how teachers thought about themselves as readers and how they discussed race and equity through YA books. Um, I also wanted to know how they might reimagine reading in their classroom for their students. So and this is important. I, um, I position data not as something to be collected, but rather something that is created through experiences. 
I use some traditional methods of data analysis, but uh, using Dr. Haney Yoon's approach to, doctor, to data analysis, I really tried to look at my data in new ways. Um, so last year I heard this sentence on a podcast and it was, we know more than we can say. And it stuck with me. Um, in my work, I'm seeking to get uh, to know what we know more than what we can say. So I looked for what McClure calls the glows in data. This meant that sometimes I wrote poetry from the transcripts or I made a collage around a particular theme that struck me. Um, one time I took a quote from a participant and made a video and set it to a Lizzo song. All of these glows helped me engage with the data in new ways, which led me to a deeper understanding. So Jennifer was a glow. During our first club, book club meeting, she said, there weren't books for fat biracial girls like me when I was younger. This stuck with me because she was addressing both her own identity as a reader and the lack of representation she experienced. I wanted to know more. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on her experience. Um, and as a side note, I asked her to send me a picture so she could represent herself. And she sent this adorable bitmoji that just worked perfectly. So in my analysis of the book club re recording, my notes, interview notes, I noticed three themes in Jennifer's notions of herself as a reader. She talked about understanding past harm, exploring reading identities and reading as a social process. She really uh, went in depth and talked about negative experiences she had in English language arts classes, times she felt marginalized and others. She also discussed the role of Rudine Sins Bishop's foundational article about windows and mirrors in literature, both for herself and for her students. And finally, she talked about a shift in her own practice from products and assessments to process and co-constructing of meaning. So um, Jennifer had a number of negative experiences with reading, but her ninth grade honors English class was especially bad. Her experiences resonate with Bettina Love's notion of spirit murdering that happens to black and brown students in school spaces. This led Jennifer to think about how she talks about her own students. She stopped using the word struggling to describe readers in her classroom. She examined her own biases about certain genres of literature like romance and vampire novels. She celebrated students' existing relationships with reading and used those as a foundation to build more. Um, and that past harm she experienced in many years of not seeing herself in books led to this turning point when she read a book where she saw herself. She reflected on how she felt reading that book in comparison to books that centered white characters. Um, and she really, she thought about that and she reflected on her own practice. And that is really the crux of why I think teacher book clubs are important. Um, so she adjusted her instructional practice to make sure all of her students see themselves in literature. And she did that by diversifying her classroom library, but she also added a practice of reading one picture book a day. And what that did was that allowed her to add so many more stories to her classroom and ensured that those stories could connect with students in lots of different ways. So in Jennifer's mind, reading is a social act. Readers co-construct their understanding and book clubs provide a rich opportunity to create a community of readers to explore issues of race and equity. So what that, mean for her, what that meant for her practice was she stopped using uh, only written assessments. She used book clubs um, as a teaching tool and she had book clubs fishbowl their meetings for the class so she could talk about the process and learn how to deepen their discussions. And during distance learning, she used tech tools like Flipgrid and Padlet um, to help find new ways for students to engage with each other about their books. So this is the big question, what book should we read? And the answer is, there's no right answer. Um, 
as teachers, we should all be reading books that we can recommend to our students. And there isn't a single list you can read, um, but there are many, many lists um, and places like the Coretta Scott King Awards, the Stonewall Book Awards, the Michael L. Prince Awards, National Book Awards, those are good places to start. And we want to read widely, so we have a range of books to recommend to our students. We also want to know that our student, we want to know our students well, so we can recommend books that speak to their interests. So this is another page from New Kid. The librarian at the school suggests books to two characters. The books she offers them don't speak to their interests. Rather, the books match her preconceived notions of them based on race. And so when we read a range of books and know our students well, we can avoid this mistake. And this is another one of Jordan's drawings where he critiques the range of quote unquote mainstream books versus the books featuring black characters. Um, and so we all know the danger of a single story. We want to make sure books in our classrooms and schools offer kids multiple stories with characters that look like them and have a diverse range of students. And um, I especially, I loved this feature of this book where Jordan processes his, processes his own feelings about that. Um, and I just want to read, I don't know if you can see, but the, at the bottom it says this review of that book, Gritty. And it says, a gritty urban reminder of the grit of today's urban grittiness. Um, and I love, I, I know we all have heard the word grit has become very popular in education, but I loved his play on that um, and really uh, drawing attention to the limitations of uh, single stories for students. But I would be remiss if I didn't actually offer some suggestions of books. So these are some of the titles our book club has read. We try to make genre, format, representation, and social justice issues. We, we also try to privilege own voices books while being aware of the limitations of that label. Um, so one thing, and I'm gonna briefly go through some of these books, but I wanna start with Long Way Down. Um, and that was a book that uh, when we decided to read as a book club, it came up. So there's the original novel in verse, um, and then there's now a graphic novel. And um, the audiobook. Jason Reynolds reads the audiobook. So together as a book club, we decided uh, people could read um, any of those options. Maybe they wanted to read two, maybe they wanted to read all three. Um, and what it led to was a, a really rich understanding and discussion that we had as a book club. Um, and it also was a way for us to live our values because we said graphic novels are not uh, easier or less than version of a book. We said that listening to a book is, is reading a book. Um, you don't have to qualify it. So this opportunity for us to practice that was really valuable. And it, um, it led us to talk about the limitations of certain formats and the affordances of other and the affordances of, of combining all three and what a rich understanding we got. Um, and I know I'm uh, running short on time, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of these. So um, Class Act is the second book after New Kid. Um, it is told from the perspective of a different character. Um, and it, again, is, is another graphic novel. And it's just, uh, it's been really good for us as teachers to read graphic novels. Um, Leak, the Leak is another one, it's about environmental justice and, um, and journalism and the impact of censorship. Uh, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. Um, this one was one that we collectively realized that we were reading a lot of realistic fiction um, and we realized we needed to broaden um, 
the books we were reading and um, we categorize this as speculative fiction. We, we use that larger umbrella term um, because we feel like it's helpful for us to just have a larger umbrella term and not worry about is this do we call this a folk tale? Do we call this mythology? And, you know, or separate out in that way, but we just call it speculative fiction. Um, Stand Up Yumi Chung is a great book. It is um, told from the perspective of a Korean American living in Los Angeles. And there's this really lovely um, subplot about stand up comedy that, that many of us didn't know about. And we learned a lot through that. Um, a Good Kind of Trouble is about the Black Lives Matter movement and standing up and protest and what that means for someone who, uh, like Joe Knowles was talking about this morning, someone who doesn't like to cause trouble or get in trouble. Um, Two Boys Kissing is a beautiful story that is told with a... Um, Greek chorus narrator of queer men, older queer men, and it interweaves um, several stories throughout the book. Um, they Both Die at the End is a, again, speculative fiction, sort of dystopian, um, that one thing that really struck our book club was that it had uh, queer characters, but it didn't center their queerness, like it wasn't a coming out story. They were just queer characters uh, living their lives um, in this uh, dystopian world. Um, and that was something we all recognized and appreciated. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna, I can, I have the I other two books. Oh, I was gonna offer a, a two minute warning. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, uh, so No Fixed uh, Address deals with the issue of houselessness um, and mental health. And the first rule of punk um, deals with family dynamics and divorce and uh, Latinx identity. And um, we created just a very simple bibliography here. Um, and you can get to that yourself. Um, through that tiny URL. Um, and it is by no means, it's just a simple list of the books that we read in our um, book club. And there we go. Thank you so much. I included my email and my Twitter handle. So please reach out. I could talk about this forever and I was uh, holding in the um, time frame, but um, really, really, can't speak enough about the importance of teachers reading YA books so, so that they can share them with their students. Okay, thank you so much, Kali. Um, Stacia, so should we go ahead? Yes. Okay, great. If y'all are ready. Okay, we are good. Um, Kali, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm a big fan of book clubs with teachers. So that was um, really fun to hear about and for all the book, the good book recommendations. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I just shared with you um, a link to our Google slides and then I'm gonna share my screen um, and we will get started. Okay, is everybody able to see the screen? Okay, awesome, thank you. So my name is Ashley Boyd. Um, I am an associate professor at Washington State University. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina and I just visited my family, so I think my accent might be even more pronounced um, these days, but um, I have been here for about, oh gosh, going on eight years and I teach our young adult literature class and work in our English methods program. And I'm honored today to present with one of our graduate students, Rachel Woolney, and I will let her uh, just tell you a little bit about herself. So, hello, I just wanna say, um, first off, thank you for inviting us to share with you today. Um, my name is Rachel Woolney and I'm a doctoral student at Washington State University. My research is centered in disability studies and young adult literature, and I've been teaching for about four years now. Um, time flies when you're having fun. 
Um, I have co-taught um, as well as individually taught the young adult lit course that Ashley and I are going to be sharing with you today. So thank you. So um, as Rachel mentioned, we actually were afforded a wonderful opportunity. Our graduate students um, <clears throat> get to co-teach a class <clears throat> in their area of interest. And um, I teach our, our university-based young adult literature class with sort of a social justice, with a social justice focus. Um, but one of the areas that I think that I had not done as great of a job with was in the area of disability. And so I was very excited when Rachel joined because disability studies is her area. Um, and so we were able to put some things together that she's going to describe with you um, that we did with the students um, concerning disability studies and looking at young adult literature. So we really operated um, the course from this idea of windows and mirrors that we're all probably familiar with um, for our students to be reflected in the literature that we read, also to learn about um, people and others groups who are different from them. But then we also wanted to focus on this idea of um, sliding glass doors, sort of, so the transformation process of reading, but also to put this critical slant on mirrors. So when students see themselves reflected, um, that's a positive thing, right? But then also how do we get them to become critical of who they are, especially if they are students in the dominant group? And so this um, unit that we're gonna talk about really helped us to do that. We also recognize that the presence of text um, does not necessarily do all the work, right? So just because we have a book, maybe with a student with a disability in, it in our classroom, doesn't mean that students are being critical of that presentation or thinking um, deeply about that. And so it takes these pedagog pedagogical strategies to help students cultivate that critique and that awareness. And so we wanted to be very cognizant of that. So we started with this idea of disability studies, and I'll let Rachel tell you a little about that. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, disability studies is a rather new discipline, only being accepted by the Modern Language Association as a division of study in 2005. So I wanted to just take a moment to outline um, what disability studies is and how it functions. Um, I apologize in advance if this is information that you already know, um, but it's so important to like lay that groundwork. So disability studies is the examination of disability as a social construct, meaning that prior to disability studies being a um, division of study on its own, it was disability was generally um, only examined from a medical point of view and discussed as a medical condition. So this medical model approached disability as a diagnosis of the physical body where a person's life activities were disrupted, um, but with medical intervention, the body may be restored or cured. Um, the social model of DS works in contrast to the medical model and instead positions disability as a term that is subjective. So disability studies argues that disability is a result of systemic barriers, discriminatory attitudes, and social exclusion rather than physical or mental difference. Um, for this unit and in my own research, um, I often introduce disability studies as a theoretical interdisciplinary approach to understanding the ways in which all bodies function within society, as opposed to a specialized area of research that is only necessary when disability is present. So I work really hard to highlight that disability and ability are constantly being simultaneously um, defined and co-constructed in a social context, um, and that these definitions have impacts on the ways in which the body functions. By decentering <clears throat> um, disability as an individualized experience and reflecting on the ways in which ableism affects everyone, it allows us to interrogate the ways in which the subjective definitions of ability and disability construct normalcy. Um, so disability studies then ask, like, what is normal? Who decides? And what do those answers reveal? And on to you, Ashley. All right. So um, this unit in our particular, in the, we've done this a few times um, over the couple of um, iterations of the course. Um, but we usually focus on this for about two weeks on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class or Tuesday, Thursday class with our students. Again, the whole course is social justice focused. So they become sort of used to this critical angle um, that we ask them to apply. Um, usually we allow students to choose um, from a selection of books um, for this unit. And these are just a few examples of those that we've used. So Marcel in the real world, you're probably familiar with Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. 
um, unlikely hero of room 13 being in sender. So again, just a few options that we've given students um, to apply that lens of disability studies to once we have gotten them to become familiar with it. So then there's a lot of things that we do within the unit um, over the course of those two weeks. And Rachel's going to tell you a little bit about this. <clears throat> Thank you. So our, our unit always begins just like I did today with a quick overview of disability studies as a theory. I do go into a little bit more depth with students to try to get them to understand that um, disability studies functions in a lot of areas um, and interrogates a lot of different things. So um, from the theory, I then jump straight into uh, my personal position to disability. So being able-bodied myself, but always being around disability my entire life, um, I share that with students. I share my personal story and then kind of um, explain why representation in literature is so important to me and why I'm so passionate about changing social perceptions of ability and disability. So we highlight here on the slide that we offer students teacher vulnerability. Um, and really this just translates into sharing alongside students. Um, I've noticed that um, all I have to do is mention that I, that I study disability um, and disability studies specifically, and students are eager to share their own personal stories about disability in relation to themselves or family or friends that they know. Um, in the YA classroom, especially since this unit is situated in a social, social justice focused model, um, I'm always willing to be vulnerable with students and share alongside of them, including, and this one's hard for teachers sometimes, but including my own lack of expertise on a topic that we're discussing. So something that we may have um, talked about a couple weeks before then, like I may not be the expert, I'm there to learn alongside of them. Um, this often, this attitude or this sharing, it reinforces um, that we are all learners who are engaging with material, that we are all eager um, to learn more about together, kind of creating this commonality. Um, along with building this community of learners, we assign, um, we then assign Pat Patricia Dunn's text along with the ADL criteria. Um, for disability studies directly, which um, will be discussed by Ashley in just a moment in more detail. Um, from there, <clears throat> so setting up the theory, talking about it personally, allowing students to share, we jump into activities. Um, because students are eager to share at this point, um, and want, they, they generally want to learn more about disability, um, our activities begin by first learning from a personal position to the topic. So students are asked to critically think about the social perception of disability, where disability is often tied to ideas of inability. Um, we discuss how negative terms affect the body and specifically focus on how ableism or definitions of normality affect us all. So students are then asked to complete an anonymous body handout, um, labeling it with potentially disabling terms that have been associated to their own bodies. We tape up our body handouts and students are encouraged to participate in a gallery walk. Um, on the next slide, Ashley, if you wanna show that, we have an example of the body handout um, filled in with student responses that we have seen while teaching the unit. So you might see that they're not consistent together. It's because I've taken um, specific, specific terms that I've seen on individual papers and kind of compiled them um, here. The first time I did this unit, I actually cried in class because of how uh, revealing it was. Um, and it's such a moving, situation to do it collectively. Oftentimes while students are filling out their body sheets, I stand in front of the class and verbally express my own um, labels. Um, or I, you could often um, also fill out a body sheet to go along with that. Um, once students return to their seats um, after walking around the gallery and kind of getting that perspective that everybody has these kind of labels, um, we ask them one question with a raise of hands only. 
And it's if those labels have ever been, um, that have been assigned to their bodies have ever prevented them from fully participating in life. Um, so then we start to encourage students to see how labels affect us all. Um, and nine out of 10 times, the majority of the class will raise their hands, right? So it's kind of this collective idea that the way that we think about our bodies actually has physical impact on us. So the next step in the unit um, begins to transition students from a personal perspective of disability, ableism and labels to how disability specifically is represented in literature. So we begin by examining popular narratives like Harry Potter, The Hunger Games or Twilight, things that students have already previously um, been exposed to. And I absolutely love the part of this unit because students are eager to defend these works and say that these stories include disability. And it becomes this, it's so engaging when students are like, but wait, there's disability in here and begin to argue that point of view. Um, this generally, um, <clears throat> uh, while it shifts our focus in the class um, to not only like what inclusivity looks like and representation looks like and how that's super important. So them defending disability in these works is awesome that it's there, it's being represented. But then it also, we start to engage and think about it critically, like how is disability being engaged in these texts? So it's not just about, um, we have a lot of things championing, championing inclusivity at this point, but we're trying to push students past that to a critical viewpoint of that inclusivity. Um, students are then directed into a small group book discussions to discuss their chosen book for the unit. Uh, we do often give them choice. I think Cinder is the only one that I've taught where it was a whole class book. Um, and we continue cultivating and uh, this point, this critical exploration of the text. So this often is like a jumping point um, for them to start critically analyzing what they've read. So some of the questions we provide to help foster these discussions are listed here. And um, I think the next thing I'm gonna talk about is um, intersectionality. So um, while students are focusing on exploring these critical elements of how disability appears within the text, uh, we also make um, intersectionality kind of a highlight or a point of discussion um, and offer another level of critique with students. So it's like building blocks, right? They start to see the little things and then we can go deeper and deeper. Um, so disability studies actually foc focuses quite heavily on um, disability rhetoric that has been tied to class, race, gender, socioeconomic status, sex, and sexuality, where disability terms are often applied to any body um, that does not fit within cultural or social definitions of the norm. So we ask students to think about things like the women's rights movement, where women were often labeled as incapable of learning, emotional, crazy. Um, and this was all while they were trying to earn equal citizenship. Um, the right to vote, stuff like that, or the ways in which um, the African American community was also labeled during slavery, um, incapable, incapable of being able to self govern, own property, or even learn. Um, we then ask students to think critically about the way most disabled characters are represented in the text as white and coming from a medium to upper socioeconomic class. Um, and how might those perspectives change the representation of disability or ability? Um, so essentially we're asking like, how might those perspectives add to our social perspective of ability and disability? Like getting them to think broader in this um, like whole society kind of context. Um, and I will hand it back to Ashley. Okay. Thanks Rachel. Um, 
And so Rachel mentioned that we ask students when they get in their small groups to evaluate their text from the criteria that we've given them. So they read um, part of Patty Dunn's text as well as the ADL criteria, and they kind of create their own list from that reading. And so we just thought that you might be interested in seeing some of these um, criteria. So the ADL and the link is in our, um, our PowerPoint that I shared with you that from the Google slides. But things like um, avoid books that cast people as victims and evoke pity um, or that um, present characters in stereotypically positive ways, right? We're not trying to talk about like compensating for a deficiency um, or like presenting someone as a hero. Um, and then we also teach them to think about language um, and um, the ways the, that language is used in the text and making sure that um, the language that's used is appropriate. And so instead the ADL asks us to um, choose books that use language that stresses person first um, promotes empathy and understanding, demonstrates respect, um, emphasizes successes without that sort of heroic element, um, and then overall provides positive images. And so they have um, many more of these um, on the PowerPoint that we've linked, I mean, on the PDF that we've linked, but just thought you might want to see what exactly we're talking about when we say, like, use the criteria that you have to evaluate your book. And so we give them a lot of time to do this, and there's a lot of discussion. Um, and of course, they're, they're eager to critique uh, and one of the things that Rachel mentions to them in this unit is that no book is perfect um, and there's not just one representation that's all good or all bad. And so I think that that also really like complicates things for them. But she asked them like as a whole, does the text do good work and that sort of thing. And so that's for them. Um, I think that nuance is really helpful. So um, let's see. OK. Thank you. All right, we just have a few minutes left, so I'll just kind of um, speed through this part. But this is just an example excerpt from Out of My Mind that we might have students read and then think about, okay, so in this presentation, um, she talks about herself, the character, and kind of introduces herself. And is this presentation, um, does it fit with any of the criteria of things we should do or things that we shouldn't do? Um, and then, so just to move into sort of some implications of this work, we think that for readers, um, that this kind of work can really help create empathy, reflection, knowledge about disabilities, but then also for the pre-service teachers that we work with, um, sort of more broadly, it helps them to move from that medical model to social model of disabilities and really can help them think differently about things like special education in the classroom and how they treat students and inclusivity um, and affirmation. And so there's sort of a double, double edged sword here about learning about um, and having empathy, but also like translating that into their own practice when they become teachers and then thinking about what kind of books do they want to present to their students. So we have a lot of um, maybe lofty goals in this unit, but we do think that um, we achieve some of this right so they kind of give us the feedback that this is really helpful, especially when they think about if they don't know about what books to choose for their class. Um, those criteria and working through that can be really helpful. So we had hoped um, and but I think we're out of time. Um, to get your input. So I think I will just drop the Jamboard link in. And if you have a minute and you want to share with us um, any text recommendations or anything that you've done that's similar so that we can share resources. Um, if you've done any disability studies type stuff, that would be awesome. So I will stop sharing and drop that link in and then we can keep going. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, my name is Stacia. My internet went out right at the very beginning. I have the pleasure of being the chair for this. So as y'all are taking some time to hang out with that Jamboard, be dropping comments, appreciation connections in the chat or turning on your mics and cameras and sharing those with us verbally and visually. And I'll be reading what I see as questions come up. Can I, can I ask a question to, um, to uh, Ashley and Rachel? Awesome. So um, I know that the um, Anti-Defamation League talks about um, using person first language. And I'm just curious about um, conversations around that, particularly thinking about um, people with autism like to be sometimes referred to as autistic people as more of a, um, an identity that they have rather than um, an additive on. And I'm wondering how, how you talk about those sorts of um, 
differences within the disability community um, with with pre-service teachers or you know as you're thinking about reading these texts so i'll jump in with this one um i i'm always advocating that you do what the disability community of people would like you to do and you associate terms um and the way that they want to be um, addressed or the way that they want their disability to be talked about. Um, it's a way to affirm that it is um, a way for that community to connect um, as well as like we, we take on those identities, right? Um, how that translates into the classroom, uh, I always, <laughs> it's awkward because I, I, um, I, I know about disability studies, but I don't know about every disability. So I'm there to learn as well. So what I offer students to do is if they know of something um, that they can inform me of while we're discussing things, like a way to approach something differently, um, I'm open to those suggestions because I'm learning alongside of them. So that's my best advice. Um, and students are generally very happy to, to help out with that. Michelle, I appreciate your question because Rachel and I've had this conversation before um, about this exact thing because she sometimes has used different and I'm, I'm like, is that first in per person first? Is that? And she's kind of explained this to me as well. So, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? Because some people see it as, as their identity, as, 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 and it's not a net, you know, like I think there's that negativity that's around things, but, and they're like, it's not an additive. It's not, I'm this with this, it's all encompassing. Whereas other people see themselves as separate from the disability. So it's, it, I find it all fascinating and I'm still learning too, but I was just curious, yeah, what you guys had had talked about. So thanks. You know, just, sorry, just thinking about what you said, um, you might approach it the same way, the same way that pronouns are approached, right? You're asking the students the way that they want to be addressed. Um, so, yeah. Could I ask a question? Um, Oh, thank you for that. That, that was a, a really good presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I, I really appreciated your point about how, you know, like there's no one perfect book. If a character, if there's a character with a disability that, you know, it's probably not gonna be all bad and it's probably not gonna be all good. It's gonna be a mixed. And, um, you know, I think it's, your question was good to your students, like what's the overall impression, but can you talk a little bit more about what you do with a book that, like let's say they, they have a book that has a fairly good representation of disability in it, but it also has some problematic areas. I mean, how, how do, it is complicated. It is complicated, right? So how, how what can we do to help pre-service teachers, especially negotiate those, those trouble spots in books that are basically good, but have some, you know, maybe um, stereotypes or something in them that, should probably be at least talked about. I mean, how do how do you do you have any more advice on how to do that? So uh, I feel I feel kind of pressured because there's no like perfect way that this formulates itself into the classroom. So uh, take a deep breath, be open to things, right? Um, Sharon Draper's novel actually uses the R word. Um, within the text. And it's something that just I bristle um, because I know that it's a taboo word. So when we come across that, we talk about with students, with pre-service teachers about the language that we do use and about um, where that word came from. It was actually a medical diagnosis and then it transitioned into the social realm, right? So we're seeing disability studies as it like propagates into a social realm, um, even from a medical point of view. 
um, and how it's been labeled as negative and so on and so forth. And we kind of start breaking it down. Um, and then ultimately it's like getting students to think critically about like, should they be engaging with that word? Why or why not? Why is it disrespectful? How did it get to that point? Um, all of those kind of things. So I think any time that we see negative, um, there's a way to talk about it critically and essentially learn something from that. Thank you. And Dr. Dunn, thank you for your work because it is very helpful in introducing the students to this. this so yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> As soon as I saw you were going to be here, I got super nervous. <laughs> you shouldn't. You shouldn't. But thank you. Thank you very much for, for talking about it. Appreciate it. We've got a couple of minutes left in the session proper. Um, if there's anything anybody else would like to say aloud or drop in the chat, that would be wonderful. If not, there's a question from the Jamboard that I'm happy to voice as well. So the question from the Jamboard is kind of a three-parter. What successes have you had with students with reading about disabilities? What challenges do students experience in reading these? And what books would you recommend? So those are those are our questions that we hope people would have time to answer, but that's okay. Oh, I apologize, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 that's okay. Those are the ones that were up for the group, but I think we ran out of time, so. Something I wonder about, and I apologize again, um, is how do you talk about the authorship around these books? One of my friends is a, a discreet scholar in young adult, or not young adult, sorry, children's literature. Um, and she talks a lot about parents and family members writing books um, and explores the ways in which that versus professionals versus authors. Um, and does that surface in your, your teaching around these texts? We talk all semester about who gets to write what um, in the class. So that's always a hot topic. Um, like for whatever we're reading. Um, but I know, Rachel, do you, I don't know if you want to talk specifically about in the disabilities unit. Um, now I'll, I'll let you handle this one because I'm like, uh, I don't know, I'm drawing a blank on how we actually perceive it with disability. I don't think it's so much of a hot topic as with the other novels, but I don't know. Yeah, and it's a very, I mean, it is a contentious question about who gets to write what narrative. Um, and I don't, there, you know, I don't, there's not a really a right answer. Um, but I think with disabilities, especially, um, it was, sometimes it's like when you think of specific disabilities, if somebody can't voice a story in this like way, then does it, is it better to have, you know, somebody else write it to represent it than to not, right? So to have it in our classrooms. And, and that's a discussion that we have to have too. And, and how do we know it's authentic? Is it authentic? What, what can we look for to make it authentic? What kind of homework did this person do? So we talk a lot about um, what, you know, how do we know if they researched and does it, you know, and they, does, if there's like an author's note and they talk about what they've done or maybe they have a family member. So are they closer to it? Does that make it more authentic? So we go into a lot of like the factors that help um, this sort of thing. Thank you. Yeah. So we've hit the boundary of our session. Um, there is a social hour at the end of the day. So come back and join. Thank you all so much for these lovely presentations. I appreciate yes. them very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you.